tonight. The best free apps for your messy life. LA's iPad debacle and the newest Star Wars robot who has already stolen my heart. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 318 for Thursday, April 16th, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the price because everyone deserves a great night's sleep. Get $50 off any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash TN2. Just enter the promo code TN2. Welcome back. I am Megan Maroney. This is the show where we cover the day's big tech headlines and we sit down with the experts behind the headlines. We'll get to the headlines after the break, but first let's chat with Jill Duffy, tech writer for PC Magazine, the expert behind the popular weekly column Get Organized and the author of Get Organized, How to Clean Up Your Messy Digital Life. Nice to meet you, Jill. Hi, Megan. How are you? I am good. So you regularly update PC Magazine's list of the best iPhone apps. There's the 50 best free apps, the 100 best apps, the 10 must-have apps. I first, I think I need your help organizing all these lists <laughs> in my head. <laughs> What's the difference between the, two, the all those lists and who are they for? So the 100 best iPhone apps is one of our big stories. We try to update it regularly to keep fresh apps on the list and, you know, cycle off things that are no longer relevant or whatever. Um, the 100 best apps, it looks at a number of different apps across a variety of categories to try and help people find out where should they be spending their time and their money and um, avoiding the duds. That's one of the hardest things I think people have when they're overwhelmed with so many apps. So we try to put together a list that really caters to a number of different people that's going to hit a lot of the most popular categories. Um, we don't go so niche. You know, if you are a super duper sports enthusiast, maybe you like a different app than the one that we recommend. Um, but this app is going to cover all of the bases broadly. And then the 50 best free iPhone apps is, of course, all the apps that are free. And we really, really try to make sure that they are truly free. This is not a lot of stuff with in-app, you know, purchases and add-ons and additional services you have to buy. This is really and truly like the free stuff. So we try to go through, um, you know, update it from time to time, give you some recommendations of things that we think are useful and helpful. What about ads? Do a lot of those free apps have ads, banner ads at the bottom? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> that's part of the that's part of the deal, you know? Like if you're if you're not paying with your money, you're paying with something else. So it's your time, it's your eyeballs, it's your exposure to some marketing. Um and yeah, ads are very, very often part of the deal. Not always. I mean I, I think more and more we're seeing a lot of good apps that just wanna get you into the brand. So not necessarily somebody else's brand that's being advertised, but the brand of the app that's being sold. So if you have a wonderful free experience with an app, maybe Maybe when you need some sort of software for your Mac or a web app that's going to be a little bit more detailed and that you'll have to pay for, um, that company's hoping you're going to stick with them. Right. We're seeing that a lot on now. Microsoft's apps are all on iOS and you see a lot of that the Outlook app, which is one of the many email apps that I use. I love it. And, you know, there's no ads. It's, you know, it's free, but they're trying to get you into the platform. Yeah, exactly. So, so what's some of your criteria for a great app? When we look at these, um, we're often looking at reviews we've done on PC Mag. So we always do comparative reviews of products. We look at not just the apps that we think are the best, but we look at the other apps in the same category and make sure that we're comparing them. Um, we look for stability and reliability. We also take into consideration um, some of the user reviews sometimes because our experience is not always reflective of everybody's experience. So if we hear that people are complaining about buggy issues and we see some consistency in those complaints. We'll definitely take that into consideration even if we're not experiencing it. Um, we look for apps that are relevant to people's lives. We like apps that look good too. That's one of my big criteria. You know, if I want fashion in my life that looks good, I want devices in my life that look good, why would I put up with an app that's functional but has no form to it? So I like to say a looked at app is a used app and that's one of, that's actually one of my productivity uh, pointers is you've got to look at what you're using and you've got to be happy with what you're looking at. 
Right, that makes sense. So I get annoyed by apps that are always tracking my location. They're, you know, not the ones that, you know, that I can turn off. It's just always is my only choice or apps that I have no idea why they're tracking my, my location. Now, do you have any deal breakers, anything that annoy you about apps? I think um, that's a good one. Apps that are tracking your location and you don't know why. I think that's a that's a good flag um, that maybe you shouldn't use it. Um, for example, the Facebook app, I know it tracks a lot of people around. It follows a lot of your activity. I don't use it. I use the web version um, so that I can log out easily and clear my cache and dump everything and not have that following me around. Um, Something else that I don't like is when I can't sign up for a service with just my email address, when it wants to authenticate through Google or Twitter or Facebook. I don't like having to give away all of the other information that I've decided to give to one company. Um, I don't want to give that to another company before I've even tested them out and found out if they're worthwhile. So for me, that's, a, that's often a flag that will make me think twice about using a service. Right. So do you recommend, given a choice between signing up with email or signing up with Facebook or Google Plus, do you recommend people just enter a new account, use their email instead of their... I, I think for the... F well, it's kind of a tricky question. It's one of those, it depends, right? So if you're somebody who's pretty diligent about creating unique passwords for every app that you use, then yes, it's a good idea to use an email address. It might not even be your email address. It might be a disposable email address that you've created so that you can try something out safely without giving a lot of information about yourself, without putting... Um, you know, your, your true email address into somebody's servers. So I think when we're first testing out apps, that's something that I try to do. I use a unique password and sometimes I'll use an email address that's sort of a throwaway address. Um, if you really like a service though, you might want to use your Twitter, your Facebook, your Google account to authenticate because you're probably going to get some additional value. So on the one hand, you're not creating a new password. That's an easy way to, you know, not have to remember it. Um, it's authenticating through this other app. But if it's looking at your contacts, for example, and it's going to populate something in this app, maybe with your friend's photos, or it's going to help you connect with people um, on a messaging platform, you want to be able to find your friends. So you probably will want the value of that. But if you are somebody like me who tests a lot of services all the time, a lot of apps all the time, you always want to have some layer of protection before you go whole hog. Right, exactly. So do you have any tips for organizing your apps on your iPhone? I mean, I spent a lot of time last week just putting everything in folders, and then I did that, and I found that wasn't that as useful as I wanted it to be. I end up just searching for them anyway because I can't remember which folders I put them in. Yeah, so on, on iPhone in particular, um, but it also works for some Android devices depending on how you skin it. Uh, I, I have these regions I call hot spots. So it's wherever your thumb goes. If you are a side to side, up and down kind of thumb person, that's your hot spot. Those are going to be the apps that are easiest to reach. Now, I actually don't use my phone like that. I hold it like this with one hand and I'm a, I'm a touch uh, with my index finger kind of person. I just don't have very dexterous thumbs. So I like to use that first page to have all of the apps that I use most frequently. I don't put them in folders because I want to access them quickly. I want to be able to see them there. I want to remember all of my most important apps by having them in front of my face in places that are easy to reach. I think when you have apps that you use a little bit less often, that's a a good time to start putting them into folders and moving them to the second or the third screen. Right, that makes sense. So now let's get to a few of your favorite iPhone apps. What do you recommend for productivity? I'm a huge Evernote user. I, I really can't tell you how much this company has done to help me, who's already an organized person, just get a little bit more uh, advantage with all of my with all of the documents that I collect and the notes that I collect. So um, one of the ways I use Evernote on my mobile phone is to scan documents uh, when I get paper. So Evernote recently updated some of its um, backend software so that when you put a stack of papers in front of it, it very quickly finds the edges of those papers, scans it, lets you pull the next page up, processes the next one. And as it's scanning those pages, it's also running OCR. That means 
all the text in that image becomes searchable. Um, I find this is really, really useful for important documents like leases or ho home mortgages, things like that, even when it's fine print. And I also really like it for recipes. So if you see a recipe in a book, you don't have a way to digitize it easily. You can scan it with Evernote and all of those ingredients and the recipe name become searchable. I think that's just immensely valuable. Yeah, um, and a, another productivity app I like just to, to drop one in there is Asana. Uh, we use it with the PC Mag editorial team a little bit. It is a task management service. It's free to use. The web version is great and the iPhone app just kind of keeps you connected if you're already an Asana user. Is that it, with an A, Asana? Asana. Like, some people say asana. Asana, like they the are yoga big. pose. Yoga. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, so speaking of yoga and fitness, um, I saw on Twitter that you're a runner. What's your favorite running app? So lately, I've been using a lot of devices to help me run. I'm, I'm a new runner. I don't want to oversell myself here. So I'm really just learning. I'm training for my first race. Um, and I decided to do some heart rate training because one of the things I've learned covering the health and fitness beat with technology is that when you train, you want to make sure that your heart rate stays a little bit lower than you think it should be. And that's so that you can go a little bit longer than you might normally be able to. Um, so I'm using an app by Mio right now called Mio Go, and it connects to a Mio global watch that I have. It's called an Alpha 2. That reads my heart rate, and I can see on it um, what my heart rate is and what my heart rate zone is. So I know to stay in that you know zone 3 or zone 4 rather than pushing myself really hard. At the end of the run, I look at the Mio app. It tells me where I was, where my heart rate was the whole time, my speed, my pace, all that great stuff. So can you use it without the device, or do you have to? Does it work with the heart rate monitor that I guess there's not really a heart rate monitor in the yeah I, th I think it has some functionality if you want to use it for your runs if you're just tracking runs though and you don't have a heart rate monitor necessarily I really like Runtastic uh, this is an app by a European company they have so many apps but their their standard Runtastic app um, will track your runs and it has a nice little heat map at the end so you can see where you ran faster where you ran slower have you used GPS, the G I P I S, that app? No. Yeah, it's one that someone recommended to me. I'm training with a group of women, and um, they all use that so that we can all be friends with. But it's not; it doesn't have all the features that you're talking about. So I'm definitely looking for something else. What about travel? What's your favorite travel app? Oh, I have so many. Um, one of my favorites is Gate Guru. So very often I'm stuck with quick layovers, traveling from one city to another, and that's usually when I need to eat. And I'm very picky about the quality of the food that I eat. So before I get to, say, Houston Airport, I can pull up this app called Gate Guru. It's totally free. And I'll look up Houston Airport, find what terminal I'm flying into, and look for highly reviewed uh, restaurants that are in that area. So it's a really helpful um, quick little app that gives you lots of information about airports. Oh, so that not around the airport, but actually in the airport inside the so airport. So good food yeah. can be found in the airport is what you're trying good to say. Good food and ATMs as well. So if you have a specific bank, you need to hit the ATM. You can very quickly find it on the app before you even land in the airport. Excellent. So today we heard that the Apple Watch was not going to be available in stores to buy and walk out of until May. You can go, you can try it on, you can order it online, but those of us without the patience are going to have to settle for our Pebble watches oh. for now. I know you've written recently that you were going to wait for the next version of the Apple Watch. Now that it's out, is, is that still what you're thinking? Yeah, I mean, as a as somebody who writes about technology, I'm sure I will have an Apple Watch at some point for probably about two or three weeks. I'll use it, I'll test it. Um, but for my taste, I'm I'm a little bit of a late adopter in my personal life. I think with Apple products in particular, um, I want that price to drop a little bit. And I think that will happen in the second generation. I also think that Apple is very good at listening to its users and listening to its app developers and finding out what people want and actually changing products to reflect what people want. So I have a feeling that if I wait another year or two, um, the Apple Watch might be a little bit closer to something I really want to spend some money on. And hopefully that money will be a little less than what they're charging now. Right. So have you seen any apps that... Um uh, that are designed for the Apple Watch that, that you like yet? 
Yeah, there are a lot of apps that have just updated um, to have some integration with Apple Watch. A lot are coming from health companies. Those are the ones that I have the most interest in. Um, the Apple Watch, of course, has a digital heart rate monitor on the back, an optical heart rate monitor, I should say. So a lot of the apps that um, read your heart rate and do fitness are the ones that I'm most interested in testing. Um, I could go through a long list of the companies, but I, I feel like that might take a while. <laughs> Um, what else am I interested in? I'm interested in some of the financial stuff too. I think mobile payments is a space that may take off finally in this country. And um, I'm very curious to see if Apple is going to be the company to make the big push to try and get the retailers to actually support the innovation. Right. What about you? Do you how do you think about it being a way to make people more productive, to spend less time on their phones, to you know, be, be more productive? Do you think that that's going to be one of its features? I, I really don't. I think people are kind of kidding themselves if they think they're going to get a great amount of efficiency out of having a watch um, on their wrist rather than having a smartphone screen. There are some ways that it does make life a little more convenient. So I'm, I'm wearing a watch right now, um, the Garmin Vivo Active, and it has some push notifications for both iOS and Android. And I find there are some times when it's very, um, it's very socially polite to not look at my phone, but to just glance at my watch and see, okay, I have an incoming text message and it's not very important. Um, I also find that it's easy to get uh, two-factor authentication codes. So again, I log into a website, I'm doing two-factor authentication. The website is going to text me some sort of code or number that I'm going to key in. It's pretty convenient instead of looking at my phone to just glance at my watch and then type it in. But I don't see that as being a huge productivity gain. I think that's more a life convenience. Right. Well, it's a security gain, I guess. People's you know reason for not doing two-factor authentication is that that they're too lazy, then maybe this will help them. It does. It speeds it up, you know, marginally. Right. And did yeah. you see the, e the email app Dart that they displayed at, um, at the Apple Watch event was really interesting. It was, you know, it was just, just a real yes or no, and it made everything really um, easy to respond to email. I don't know if you've seen that app, but that looked interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, it, it could be interesting, but again, like, I don't think that's going to revolutionize the problems we actually have with email. That's true. Well, Jill Duffy, thank you so much. Jill is a writer at uh, PC Magazine, and uh, you can follow her on Twitter. Where else should people find you in your work? Uh, I'm Twitter. I'm J-I-L-L-E-D-U-F-F-Y, Jill E. Duffy. Um, and that's, uh, you can find lots of other links to my work on the Twitter, on Twitter. And your book is available on Amazon or wherever people buy their books, correct? Yeah, it's predominantly an ebook. So anywhere that you can buy ebooks, um, you can get it. It's called Get Organized, How to Clean Up Your Messy Digital Life. Well, thank you, Jill. I look forward to having you on when you have your Apple Watch and we can talk about how <laughs> you use it because I think you have some great insights in this area. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Megan. Good thank to talk to you. Take care. Coming up, Google rival Cyanogen teams up with Microsoft and the Etsy IPO reveals just how big the market for knitted zombie sock monkeys really is. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Casper. Casper is an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the cost. Casper is revolutionizing the mattress industry by cutting the cost of dealing with resellers and showrooms and passing that savings directly to the consumer, you. Casper mattresses are made with two technologies, latex and memory foam. They come together for better nights and brighter days. Now, this is for real. You can check out the May issue of Consumer Reports, the one with the big tomato on the front. Casper mattresses got a little write-up and a recommended rating. It's a comfortable mattress that has just the right sink and bounce and provides long-lasting comfort and support. I got my new Casper mattress and I tried it out. It's so soft and it's comfortable. I wish I were laying down on it right now. You can buy one easily online for yourself and it's completely risk-free. Casper understands the importance of trying out a mattress. Try sleeping on a Casper mattress today. You get free delivery and painless returns within a 100-day period so you don't have to lie down in a showroom. Casper's mattresses are made right here in the U.S. Get a Casper mattress. It's $500 for a twin, $950 for a king size. Compared to industry averages, that is a great price. And you can save an additional $50 as one of our audience members by going to casper.com slash TN2 and entering the promo code TN2. It's number two. That's casper.com slash TN2 and promo code TN2. 
Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Earlier this week, we reported that Yahoo's Marissa Mayer was looking for new ways to increase the company's revenue. And today she announced one way that might happen. The Wall Street Journal reports that Microsoft and Yahoo have updated their search partnership that amends the deal struck between the two companies in 2009. And in case you're keeping track, that was before Meyer and Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella were at the helms of the two companies. The new deal now offers Yahoo more flexibility in how it monetizes its search traffic and allows Yahoo and Microsoft to be more of a threat to Google's search dominance. And speaking of Microsoft's deals that are chipping away at Google's profits, today Android rival Cyanogen officially announced their rumored partnership with Microsoft. Part of the deal includes the integration of Microsoft consumer apps and services on the Cyanogen operating system. Microsoft Office, Outlook, Skype, OneDrive, and others are included in the deal. Cyanogen is the company behind one of the most popular builds of Android and has been highly critical of Google. An iPad for every child. That was the $1.3 billion initiative put forth by the Los Angeles Unified School District in 2013. Now the school district is asking for a refund. In a letter sent this week to Apple, the LA school superintendent's Superintendent wrote, quote, we will not accept or compensate Apple for new deliveries of curriculum, end quote. LAUSD agreed to buy the iPads for $760 each, and that did not even include the additional $200 per unit for a math and English curriculum from education publication company Pearson. Personally, I think Chromebooks are a better fit for the classroom than iPads are, but it does appear that this might be mostly the fault of the Pearson software, of which, according to the LA Times, the district didn't even see the full version of before the deal was signed. Teachers and principals never fully embraced the product, and there was a whole host of problems implementing the curriculum, which will surprise absolutely no one who has ever tried to introduce new technology to any classroom anywhere. The current superintendent, not the same one who inked the deal, he is long gone, says he wrote the letter in order to put Apple and Pearson on notice. Crafting site Etsy went public today. The stock jumped 88%, according to The Street, and it's now worth over $3.5 billion, which proves once and for all that there is a market for homemade goods, no matter how weird they are. And finally, in case you just woke up and have not been on the internet yet today, I am here to tell you that the newest teaser for the new J.J. Abrams Lucasfilm production, Star Wars The Force Awakens, came out this morning. Twitter also revealed several new Star Wars emoji available for all your Star Wars emoji needs. To get the emoji, use the hashtag Stormtrooper, hashtag C-3PO, and hashtag BB-8. BB-8 is the newest robot to join the crew, and he will reportedly not be CGI, as he took the stage at Star Wars Celebration Weekend in Anaheim, California this morning, at the which time he also stole my heart. And that is the, it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv, and you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.